Hello, Epicumans, to another episode of Region Civics. Um, there's a couple of routes that we can go today. Um, there's a lot of routes we can go every time. Um, first one is we can do a, a high level overview of the, the series I just put together, which is meant to be kind of an orientation into what we're doing here. So how do we transition from one civilization to a the next? There's a whole lot that we've been kind of exploring this last you know, decade, but really in earnest these last few years. Um, that I think is kind of like required understanding for people to be able to orient themselves into what's going on here. So that was my intention here was to create a series that anyone who's showing up to any of our projects, they can watch, kind of get on a similar page. So we have a shared base of understanding to kind of move from. Um, so I'd like to present that at some point to you all and then get all your feedback being like, this, you know, makes sense. This is what's missing. You know, this is a perspective that we mean to make sure is included or anything like that. Um, so that as we're telling the story, we are making sure it's inclusive of all the different perspectives that we're holding here. Um, so that's one route that we can go today. Uh, another route we can go is an open just Q&A form with everyone where you're at with designing your organizations and your game guides. So it's a huge thing we kind of you know, started to unpack. So I'd love to know like where your barriers are and just open up talking about that and discuss as a group. Um, so that's two different routes we can go today. We can maybe even accomplish them both. Um, so that's what I'm proposing. And I'll pause here in case anyone has any other routes they would like to go today or anything they would like to bring. Or are we happy with those two routes? I, I think the overview would be good, and probably there'll be time to hear which what every project's doing. All right, great. Um, then that's exactly what I'll do. Um, Stephen, see your hand up. Actually, I just think it's like I think there'd be a good time for us to sort of pause in the sort of um, description of all the material that we're absorbing and get feedback from everybody in a general feedback session. I think timing for that would be good. So for this to be that feedback session? Yeah, I just, what you propose is that you give us two alternatives and I, I guess I'm putting my hand up for your second alternative. Okay, well then uh, let's do both. So I can give the too long didn't read. Um, I was intending for this to be like an 18 minute overview, like orientation episode that we can introduce whenever we introduce a project. So again, all of our project videos have been about five minutes long. This is like someone watches that, but we've been through the process anyway, of like showing people that they're like, oh, this is a great video, but it's super unpractical. There's so many barriers, like they're not considering X, Y, and Z and so much stuff, right? Um, but we are considering X, Y, and Z. So I'm like, all right, we actually need a follow-up video that gives the context to what's going on here. So that was the initial, you know, spark that got started here. Um, here it is almost two months later and it turned into a, you know, let me share how long it is now. Um, I think it's gonna end up maybe being like 10 episodes. Um, yeah, so it's a uh, hundred and something slides now. Yeah, 170. Um, so it got a little out of control. So what I'm wanting to do now is to just give a too long didn't watch version of it, uh, a general overview of what this is. And I want to make sure I'm touching all of the points and then we can discuss it afterwards. Um, so I'll pause there in case there's any thoughts before I just dive into this because it's going to take maybe 15 minutes. So any other thoughts or feedback before I dive into this? All right, well then I will just dive into it. So this is the too long didn't watch version of what's going on with region civics. So each episode will be introduced by what's going on in what region we're introducing the project. So the first one's gonna be Central and South America, introduce the three projects that are operating here. Oh, so it looks like this. Then we go into each one of the videos and each project is introduced with their own card that looks like this. And then it introduces the project and what's going on with them. The three project videos show. And then after the videos is when this pops up and I pop up. 
I say, okay, what's the context of what's going on here? We're moving from this kind of mono exploitive degenerative economy that's taking over the globe and we're diversifying it. We're creating these startup societies. We're reimagining you know, what society could actually look like, what economies could look like, how we organize to meet our needs, et cetera, et cetera. So I kind of explain the big meta picture that's you know, happening here. Um, then I introduce Regen Civics and I really help try to ground it. Um, so what I believe, you know, I've been trying to think through this, you know, what is the main thing that's most important here? It's, you know, how do we survive and thrive? How do we meet our needs? I think that's the fundamental question we're trying to answer here. Um, so how do we come together with other groups of people? And, you know, one, it's how do we survive this global civilization in decline? So we're looking at all the indicators of all these different crises and they're culminating. So how do we say, okay, we understand that civilization's collapsing in a lot of different ways. How do we make sure we're surviving? Our families, our communities, you know, what does that actually look like? So this is one path of, you know, surviving. But, you know, we're not just here to survive, we're here to thrive. And maybe it's not a civilization in collapse, maybe it's a civilization in transition, you know? So how do we redesign what civilization can look like and how do we experiment with that? How do we start prototyping alternatives? So now I'm introducing what we're doing with all 13 of the projects, talking about us seeing how we can prototype alternative civilization styles so our families can thrive. We can meet our needs in a more effective way. So then I try to help ground it with folks. Be like, all right, what's going on here? Um, there's two axes here. You know, there's a civilization where humans are living more in cities, civilizations where humans are living with nature. So I'm trying to like create an axis to plot all the different styles of civilization. Um, one where power, you know, economic governance, et cetera, is concentrating and centralizing, you know, one axis here. Um, and another one where it's decentralizing, another axis here. So you can kind of plot all the different civilization structures somewhere on these coordinates, at least this was my intention. Um, and then we get started with some. So here's current civilization. It's concentrating wealth at an increasingly faster rate. Um, and it's humans living more and more in cities that are destroying nature. Um, it doesn't pop up like this. It's really beautiful and has a lot of animations. But anyway, that's a general idea. That's currently where civilization is headed. That's not an option. Um, I introduced then the concept now of games. Now, so this is us making our game guides with all the projects, right? But it's the current game, it's just like Monopoly. In fact, Monopoly was a game to literally educate people on how our current system's broken. You know, So the original game was, it was called the Landowner's Game and it had multiple ways that you could play it. One of them was called Monopoly, where the outcome was one person owned all of the houses and they were the winner. You know, The other version ended when everyone had one space of their own and their own hotel built on it. So once everyone you know, had all of their needs met and the whole community was thriving, that was the other way to achieve victory. And it was actually to teach you know, that, hey, capitalism, markets, et cetera, if they're unrestrained is gonna end with you know, boards usually getting flipped over and you know, a lot of people fighting because there's only one winner, right? So I kind of explained that, that you know, civilization styles, let's just think of them as games. Currently we've been playing Monopoly. It hasn't really been working out. And then talk about how, you know, Ray Dalio, he really talks about these games, what they look like. So anyway, I talk about different, the concept of games, et cetera, I explain that a little bit more. Um, talk about some different civilization styles. So for example, the World Economic Forum and them, they're talking about these smart cities, et cetera, you know, condensing it and building a half a kilometer high city and all this type of stuff. Um, so that's happening, but it's still concentrating power and it's humans living in cities talk about a whole bunch of more stuff that we know give some examples blah 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 so you guys get a lot of this stuff um then i start here and i talk about the network state so this is where web3 kind of comes into this is now we can build civilization styles that aren't necessarily rooted in one particular place so for example all 13 of our projects we could be considered a new type of state you know, we're coordinating, we have projects all across the globe, but now we can you know, start building our own currencies and all this fun stuff. So I introduced the idea of a startup country um, and talk a little bit more about what we're doing. So this is helping ground it like, okay, what's happening here? Civilization change is happening. There's all these different styles of civilization that's happening. Um, how can you get involved? So now I bring in region civics and explain this stuff a little bit more. Um, and where Regent Civics is operating. So if you see over here, we're saying we're only operating with setting up new types of civilizations that are one, decentralizing governance and economic power. 
So if you're working on, you know, keep centralizing it, like again, you know, World Economic Forum and what they're advertising, you know, we're not really interested in that. But then we're also looking at projects that are more helping people live in harmony with nature. We're not just looking at paving paradise and putting up more gaudy urban sprawls. We're talking about how can we create civilizations where we're in harmony with the natural world and the environment around us. So it's kind of like helping people understand, okay, where does region civics fit into this whole picture? Um, and of course, as you can see with there being so much text on the screen that it's, <laughs> there's a lot to unpack here. Um, so that's why I feel like, okay, these are actually turning into probably longer episodes to really unpack, you know, what all of this stuff means. Okay, but then we get into the idea of game guides. So a lot's going on here. We need to simplify it. Groups of friends can come together. They can open up a box. They could look at a game guide and they learn how to play the game. What's their role? How do you go around the board? You know, how do you engage with people? All of these things. You know, every game kind of answer these questions for people before they play it. Okay, each one of our projects is going to answer these questions. Um, okay, so what's actually in your game? Your game contains this idea of a minimum viable regenerative society. So it's the base pieces you need to set up a little kind of a self-sufficient economic system so that all of your community's needs are met um, within the game itself. So at the top of it, of course, you say, what's the game? That's the five minute video all of the projects have created. Then we start getting into what this whole incubator was about, which is the patterns of co-creation. So how are people coming together and how are they creating? So what's the economics look like? What's the map of your ecosystem? You know, how are people creating? How are they making decisions? What's the roles? All of that stuff. Um, not sorry, not roles yet, but the, the broad ways of how you guys are organizing economics. Um, legal structures, so we touched on that a little bit. Um, that's included in the game. And then the circles, roles, archetypes, quests. So this is what we're gonna keep getting into in the incubator, but this is also covered. And then crowd pooling, how do you start? So that's also part of the game is how do you actually start the game? How do you pool all the resources necessary and fill the roles needed to actually say, yep, all the positions are here, we can start playing. So in this way, you can kind of look at it as a sports team. You know, any sports out there, you have a certain number of members that need to be on that team in order for them to actually play the sport. It's got to be very similar with our projects. If we're trying to create a self-sufficient economic system or a community where our needs are being met, there's a minimum number of players you know, people that need to be able to show up in order to make that happen. So we need to identify that kind of going forward um, from the onset when we set up the crown pooling structure, which I'll get into more in a bit. Uh, and then governance process, which is going to be ongoing. So this is part of the infinite game. The infinite game means it never ends. So the point of the game is for us to continually improve the game and the game is to meet our needs. So unlike Monopoly, which ends when one person has all of the, you know, owns all the money, our game doesn't end. It's everyone has their own hotel, their own piece of land, keep improving to meet. Uh, so this is continue creating together as we keep it going. Oh, let me do that. Uh, the ongoing governance process as we, yeah, you guys get that. Okay. So I was just talking about the minimum role. So we need to create something like this for each one of our projects. What are the main needs we're trying to meet and how are we going to meet them? So each one of these circles was set up to meet one of our most you know, fundamental needs. So we would do a very similar thing within our projects. We say, okay, we'll set up a circle who's tasked with meeting the need for food and fertility through our community. So they're you know, taking care of the soil, growing food and meeting those needs. So we have people meeting the need for water, meeting the need for love, meeting the need for people to figure out what their purpose is and what their role is and how they fit into the community. You know, etc. So this is up. So what we'll unpack here going forward, in our incubator, but we have to set up the idea. Of this is the game board. These are the different, you know, circles that exist. Is what we're calling them. But you can also look at them as kind of like departments and an organization, or uh, um, I guess economic. Hmm, maybe that's a weird way of explaining it. Never mind. So anyway, long story short, is we're setting up what we're calling a minimum viable regenerative economy, or in this case, a role-based economy. So instead of, you know, capitalist economies where you say, okay, we're going to meet all of your needs through the market. We're going to let businesses try to meet your need for food. So businesses get established to grow food, prepare food, and sell it to you for a profit or whatever it is. 
right? So their incentive isn't for food to be free and abundant. Their incentive is for you to buy food from them. So all the ways that we can make food free and abundant, and that's, you know, the technology that's available for us to do that, it doesn't necessarily make sense for a business to go about doing that because they'll put themselves out of business and then how are they going to feed their families, et cetera. So we want to kind of override that problem and say, okay, actually, no, your circle, you're just responsible for feeding everyone and making sure everyone in this, you know, minimum viable economies need for food is met. And then the people that are in that circle, they get to go about exploring the most advanced technology or whatever they want to do to meet people's needs of food. Maybe that means going out there and guerrilla gardening and putting up fruit, fruit trees everywhere throughout the community or whatever it is. Now they're just exploring what's the most effective way we can meet our need for food as a community. So that's the big kind of you know, evolution we're going through here is we're setting up these circles where they just explore that question. What's the most effective way to meet everyone's needs for water in our community? You know, maybe the most effective way is for one person to buy, you know, bottled water in bulk and get a cheap deal for everyone to drink bottled water. Like, okay, maybe that's one way. Or maybe another way is for them to make, you know, springs drinkable again and make them so they have, you know, fresh access to spring water in their community or whatever that is, right? Which is what I'm actually advocating for. So this helps us set up economies where there is people who are getting paid or who have a role to meet the need for water for that community who could then go out and make sure our rivers are drinkable again and clean our springs and make sure that they're flowing and doing the beautiful stuff that they should be doing, et cetera. Um, same thing for housing and everything else. So we have that same concept. So if you have a circle who's meeting the need for housing, maybe they're doing that by collecting, you know, $200,000 and contracting builders and, um, setting up housing for people as they join the community and just doing it one-off deals. Maybe they're organizing house building festivals and everyone in the community gives three hours to actually build a new member's house. So instead of contracting outside with developers, we're using natural building techniques and, you know, a lot of human labor to actually put houses together and building them as a community. But see, there's, a, there's an infinite number of ways that we can go about meeting our needs for housing. We can use the free market and capitalistic techniques or we can come up with new techniques, right? Um, so this is really kind of a general idea. So I'll stop there because I can give a million examples and I will in the episodes. But the idea is there we can think about what needs are we trying to meet and then how are we gonna go about meeting those needs? Um, which is actually what this whole section here is about. So I kind of introduced it maybe a little bit weird. Um, so here is us expressing our needs. So every community, I think it's really helpful to do this to actually say what needs in our community are we trying to meet? So I've mentioned this before, but it's the place to start. We say, hey, we're gonna meet the people's needs for housing. If that's the only need you're trying to meet, fine. Here, I can actually put it on a slideshow and make this a little bit bigger for somebody else. Yeah, so some communities might only be trying to meet one need, saying, hey, we're just here to meet the need for housing. You know, or you can say, actually, we're trying to meet a lot of other needs for community members as well. Like we're actually going to try to meet the need for love. You know, it's not something we say, go, you know, try to figure that out on your own time. We say, no, nope, as an organization, we're going to try to coordinate meeting the need for love for everyone who's part of this organization. You know, we're going to need the need for growth, et cetera. So what does that actually look like? Of course, that's what this whole exploration is. So we start off saying, what needs are we trying to meet for members who are joining our projects? They could be really extensive, like you're seeing here. Um, they could not be. And that's where you fit on this graph here, is you're saying, what's the breadth of needs we're trying to meet? Let me put it on a slideshow so it doesn't look so gaudy. Yeah. So we're saying, what's the breadth of needs we're trying to meet? How many needs are we trying to meet? And then how deeply are we trying to meet them? Are we just trying to superficially meet them? Are we trying to really understand the need? Um, and fully meet it? Or are we trying to even help people move beyond and self-actualize and find out new needs and be able to meet those as well? So it's why these arrows are kind of infinite, is there's probably no real end here. Um, so each project is going to say where they kind of fit on this. So you kind of see, you know, businesses here. It's very clear a lot of times they say, hey, you know, these needs aren't part of the business. Like your need to feel love, that's not something you meet at work. You know, you figure that out at home. So businesses have really clear demarcations and it's obvious in our culture, you know, what needs they're there to meet and what needs they're not there to meet. And sometimes they even work against us meeting our needs, right? 
So this is where we're being clear, we're saying how deeply are we trying to meet needs? You know, some of our projects might, you know, fit here more in the middle where we're saying, hey, we're not trying to be completely overwhelming and meet everything. Um, you know, it sounds too much like a commune, which is exactly what a commune is, is they're trying to say, hey, we're trying to meet everyone's needs and their totality of their needs. And that's not what every project is going to be trying to do. Um, but it is really helpful because that's going to alleviate a lot of tension because if some people show up feeling like, hey, you know, it's a commune environment, feeling like all of their needs should be met by that community, should be a clear word there. That's going to create a lot of conflict from people who say like, oh, no, actually, this community was just here for, you know, shared housing. You know, our need for housing was meant to be met in this community and nothing else. If people are thinking that versus people thinking something else, you can see that being a general source of tension and conflict and misalignment of what the, you know, the main goal of that community is. Um, so I do think this is really helpful for you to identify, you know, where on this graph do you feel like your project belongs? Um, so anyway, I open up that idea and then say, okay, once you've identified what, you know, how many needs you're trying to meet, then you go about how are you going to try to meet them? So say you're trying to meet the need for housing. You know, what types of technology? So this is the two axes here. The top axis is the technology, you know, whether it's artificial technology or organic technology. Those are two expanding axes and they build on each other. Um, meaning more advanced artificial technology begets more, even more advanced artificial technology. You know, computers can help us make more advanced computers. Um, and it's the same thing with organic technology. You notice this in meditation as you start gaining more capacities in order to drop into new states of awareness, then those open up even more new states of awareness and consciousness and capabilities, right? So our organic technology also improves as we you know, build on top of it. So again, these are just axes to try to like, you know, figure out the different projects here, how we're approaching things. So anyway, how are we approaching meeting our need for housing? Is it artificial technology or organic technology, right? Where does it fit there? And then are we using economic systems that are centralizing power or decentralizing power? And I really want to post the idea that none of these are good or bad. You know, for example, meeting our need for security, it's probably better. And actually, I'll show that one. Yeah, for example, you know, meeting our need for security could actually be really beautifully met from centralized power. If there is one, you know, omnipotent, benevolent, all powerful being that could exist on planet and say, hey, you know, I'm going to keep the laws of peace. And if anyone tries to stop that, then we can destroy your country. Then that could, you know, ensure world peace. If you had one super powerful force making sure world peace exists. And that's kind of what the US is doing right now in a very terrible way. Um, so for example, some cases you do want a monopoly. If you have a monopoly on violence, that usually creates a container where there's going to be less micro violence. So for example, in a nation state, if they have a monopoly on the violence, it means that companies aren't you know, fighting each other and killing each other over resources because they know that the nation state's going to show up and stop them from doing that. So some cases, it does actually make sense to try to centralize things, but maybe not. Anyway, so I say that to just point it out that we're trying to get rid of this idea of one being good and one being bad, um, but really just trying to identify how we're meeting that need. So again, starting off with housing, for example, we can use artificial technology and use a free market system. So businesses sell 3D printed homes to new people who show up to your project. Your project, you're making money as a project, you sell houses to people who show up to it. Okay, so you're using a free market based economy to sell 3D printed, you know, hempcrete homes. So you would say you'd fit right here. Or you could say, actually, our project has a habitat circle, and their role is to print 3D printed hempcrete houses as new members show up. So they don't sell houses, they build a basic house, they offer a certain model. If people want to improve on that model, maybe they can pay more, but they offer a model for everyone who shows up to the community, this particular project might. Um, so that's one way of meeting the need for housing. Or you have, you know, house building festivals, which is, you know, organic technology, our own muscles, where we show up and build houses for people who show up to the community or whatever. So we say, okay, our need for housing, how do we go about as a project to meet that need? And then you break that down for, you know, every need. How do we meet our need for food? How do we meet our need for life-giving water, um, life-giving air, healthcare, et cetera? And then I'll unpack some of this stuff more in the episode where we get about meeting our needs. But 
Um, and some things that we need to talk about, you know, our current economy is like, we don't even talk about the most basic kind of human function, loving families. Like how do we create the environment for babies to be raised with a lot of love, a lot of care, so that humans develop in an effective way. So we have societies that are stable and meaningful. You know, we don't even really talk about that in our current economic systems, but we really ought to. So we say, okay, well, how do we create the, you know, meet our need for loving families um, and actually talk about this, right? Um, and try to meet this need as a, you guys get it, so I'll pause there. Um, access to land. So this is another really kind of big one. Um, you as a project could own all of the land. So it's another case where a monopoly, one entity owning everything isn't necessarily good or bad. A lot of projects are talking about this, where a trust technically owns all of the land. So it's technically centralized into one entity. So you could say that, okay, our project, you know, this Dow LLC or whatever it is, technically owns all of the land. All right, so they control all of it. And then the rules by that you know, project are what dictates who has access to it. So you can say, hey, you know, this trust technically owns all the land and you can have access to that land indefinitely as long as you are, you know, being a regenerative steward and caring for the land and doing X, Y, Z or whatever it is. So then the project can say, as long as you meet these, you know, requirements, then you get access to the land. So you say, okay, well, we're a monopoly based economy where the Dow owns all the land and you get access to it as long as you meet these requirements. Or you could be all the way over here where technically speaking, each family owns their hectare and you're actually selling the land to those the families that are moving in and they decentralize land ownership and what that means. Um, they each come with their own perks and you know, trade-offs so we can actually get into this someday because it's really important. Um, but we can actually say where we fit on this. Are we saying every family is gonna own their land outright? Or are we saying actually the project is gonna own the land and then govern who has access to it? Again, no, no real good and bad here. So we're trying, I, I'm giving this example again, just to kind of break out of that, you know, silo way of thinking of centralizing being bad and decentralizing being good. Um, and I actually think a really happy spot exists around here between roles and sovereigns. But anyway, it's another day. Um, shared decisions. How are you guys making decisions as a community? You know, do you have a C-suite, a CEO and a founder who has a lot of power and authority? Um, or are you using consensus and are on the other side of that extreme? So where as a project are you, you know, sitting here? Okay, so this is how we're kind of meeting our needs. We've run through that. Uh, I think I'm going too long here, so let me speed up and then end. <laughs> um, the next thing I get into is we talk a little bit more about that minimal viable economy and then get into the membranes. So how are people coming from just hearing about your project, buying a few tokens to being a core contributor and being part of the family of the main people who are there making that project thrive? So we actually are setting that up and trying to identify it. Um, so I'll, take, I'll just jump right into it. So we have the trustless side of the network. So this is what Web3 is all about, is building tools to make it trustless so that you don't have to trust people up front in order to coordinate. This is great. It means you can coordinate with way more people without having to take time to build relationships. Um, so this is at the far end of where people might step into your project. So for example, they buy a token. And then they're like, yes, you know, I've contributed to this project, but now I want to contribute more. I want to take a role. And then there's this list of available roles within your project. And they're like, great. Um, I actually want to show up and earn some tokens for contributing to this project in a role. So this is the, the green side over here. Oops, I'll actually show you this graph. So this is the green side over here. You have the tokens right here where people can buy them, trustless. You can go to an exchange, you can buy a you can buy a token. You don't need to you know, get permission to be able to do that, right? Um, and similar thing for a lot of project with roles is lots of people should be able to show up and apply for a role and be like, yep, I wanna fill that role. And the community can decide, hey, do we want this person to be able to fill that role or not? Um, so this is where trust starts to get built. If someone might step into a role, and then each month as they're contributing to the community, they're getting to know each other. They're starting to build trust with other people who are contributing to that project. You're starting to get to understand them. And month after month as they contribute and keep contributing and it's working well, you're saying, yes, I can trust this person to keep showing up, et cetera. So this is where trust building starts forming. Um, 
And this is all extrinsically guided. You know, people are in roles oftentimes because they're earning tokens, they're getting paid. You know, you're buying tokens because there's maybe an upside that can be gained from it. So this is all where, you know, extrinsically guided. You're guided by, by external factors that you can earn a profit, you know, make some money or doing something like that, right? Uh, but we all know that doesn't make for a great life. You know, meaning of life is all those intrinsic things, the things we really want to do that are meaningful and heart-centered. And, you know, we're not doing it for money. We're doing it because we love doing it. So we want to build this into our model from the beginning and not just say, okay, our, our projects ends at roles and we're all about just exchanges. No, the next stage is actually trust and knowing. Like, how do we move out of the DAO and do space? Like, you know, long term, we probably don't want to with our friends every month have to keep applying for a role we've been doing for seven years. You know, maybe after seven years of being with the same group of people, you say, you know, forget about the technology. We know how each other's showing up. Like, I trust you. You trust me. I know how you're showing up. Like, you have this deep relationship that doesn't need to be mediated by technology anymore. So now you can say, well, we can step out of the technology and we don't need that. And now we can just keep showing up the ways we know we need to. So this is when you start moving out of that accountability space where you just start, you know, free flowing. And then I think after a while of that, and after we kind of stepped out of extrinsically motivated stuff and tracking people and judging each other and all that, you know, then we have a more fertile foundation for flow-based economies to kind of emerge where they're really guided and inspired by inspiration, intuition, and we're not tracking or voting and none of that stuff matters anymore. Now it's like you're a tight knit unit who is just executing with like minimal thought. And ex anyway, it's gonna take me a while to fully express where I feel like this circle exists, but I think a lot of you get it. Um, but it's kind of that deeper layer of understanding. There's a lot of love within the community and you're just playing and co-creating together. And I think this is, it's worth noting on our map as a place that I think is worth getting to. So we're not stopping here with roles and DAOs and stuff like that. We're saying, well, let's, how do we move deeper into community, right? Um, and what's really important here too is these blue circles versus the green. The green requires technology. So it requires that we have internet access and things like that. Why blue doesn't. So blue is our, you know, security and it's what really matters. You know, what happens if there's a solar flare and all the technology burns up or whatever? It's like, well, we have our blue, we have our community, we have our tribe, we know each other, we trust each other, we don't need technology, right? So this is kind of like that security foundation that's more stable. So here it is, right? you know, it's micro stable, but it's macro fragile. You know, a community of seven families, like, yeah, you guys got each other's back, but how are you handling climate change and geopolitical collapse and, you know, wars and the Great Pacific Garbage Patch like you can't? You need networks and we need these incentive systems to be able to do that type of stuff, right? So anyway, that's a huge concept to unpack. Um, but I, I think this is worth having as a map to say, hey, these are the tools we're building to coordinate over here, but this is where we're really, can, you know, we can go with our communities to create more love and meaning and purpose. Then I talk about how the projects can then interact this way. So here's three different, I can actually have a slideshow here. So you know, here's three projects. You have this map over top of them. Um, so the tokens here in the middle is how people move from project to project. You know, you can sell one group's tokens and buy another group's tokens. You know, de-invest in Ubuntu and invest in traditional de dream factory or whatever it is. And then you can have roles that move across them. So people can invest here directly, or they can you know swap from roles to roles. So this is where it's fungible. You now you have a role that's making movies. That role that makes movies is the same role that makes movies over in Ubuntu as it is in traditional Dream Factory. So if that's your role and you can do that, you can bounce from project to project really easily, right? So again, that's the green space is that fungible and interchangeable space. It's how we move from project to project. But that blue space, that trust and knowing, that love, play, and flow with your tribe, that's non-fungible. You know, your your partner is your partner. Not you can't just swap in and out new partners and it be exactly the same, right? Um, so this is again how the kind of the process goes. So you can see people show up. You know, first they take on a role. They're like, actually, I'm going to go take over a role over on this side. You know, we want to leave Ubuntu and we want to go join La Tierra now. Um, but actually, La Tierra doesn't have the blue at all. So they show up at a quest to 
come into this blue circle and actually identify what it means to be in those blue circles. So you can kind of see a community going and actually growing the community and it being part of the process, right? And again, these things are just maps. So you can have different maps that overlay. So one map is showing the boundaries, another map is showing the minimal viable economy and how we're meeting all of our needs, right? But then these things become kind of like little spaceships. <laughs> Let me show you this, because I love this idea. Is this unit right here, this is kind of like our spaceship for traversing systems change right now. Each one of our projects can become that safe haven where all the communities or all the people that are part of that project, you know all of your needs, your basic needs and even your more advanced needs are gonna be met by this community. So then through this chaotic time of civilization change, we can get rid of all the fear and uncertainty of doubt of like what's happening out there, knowing that we have a little bit more security in our communities. So it's really kind of like, I think a, a motivating factor for me, but a driving factor for I think a lot of us to set up these kind of you know spaceships to navigate systems change, if you will. But then of course, if we start collaborating together, so that's what I call these things. Sorry, because I call them like cells. Each one of these is a coordination cell. And then I explain here how the cell kind of comes together to make this multicellular, you know, coordination ecosystem. And then how from this cell we can navigate paradigm shifts. Um, so you can that blue community, that tribe of yours, you can move from different networks. So different green areas. So the green where the networks, right? Excuse me here. Well, you can move from network to network as we design different ones. So you see this one moving from like region tokens and markets over to like a resource-based global economy that we just set up and now we figured it out. And a lot of us opt into that, great, you know? Or actually we've been moving through that. We're like, oh, actually that has its limitations. We're gonna move over here to this other, you know, protocol that's more effective, right? So then as we get into our, you know, coordination cells where our needs are getting met, we can more easily, you know, shift through paradigms as we move from network to network and ones that we wanna build. So I explained that concept. Um, all right, so then we jump back to the box and see how we're doing and then talk about crowd pooling. So all of that was designing our game. So I know there was a lot to unpack. I think I'm going longer than I tried to here. So this is my first time trying to condense this and I realize uh, there's a lot more here than I thought. Um, so anyway, after we've identified what the game actually is, now we say, how do we start the game? So this is the crowd pooling side. I shared this a little bit, but I'm just going to go over this with you guys one more time because I think it's worthwhile. So what is crowd pooling? Um, everyone knows crowdfunding. You raised money. So for example, you put up a thing. You said, hey, we need $990,000 to do our project. Um, you put that call out there and $555,000 showed up. You see the di different people and they were able to provide money. Okay, so that's the crowdfunding concept. So what is crowd pooling? It means we go further. We say, actually, what are the other forms of capital that people can bring? Um, so what's the first thing? We had land. So part of the 990,000 that was trying to get raised, well, 300,000 of that was reserved to buy land. So the community thought we needed to raise money and buy land. But they put the call out there saying, hey, we needed 10 hectares. And actually someone in their community had land that was perfect for it. Um, but I think we could do this differently. We can have people show up with land and then groups can show up and be like, hey, and they'll scout the land that's already been offered. So this is already happening. People are seeing that we're doing this incubator. They're like, yep, we have land that would be great. So anyway, there's a different way of pairing it rather than it being random. But idea still stands that, hey, instead of raising money to buy land, people have land. So now you don't need 990, you only needed 690. And now this person was able to contribute land when they didn't have cash because they were land rich, not money rich. So now they're able to contribute. Taking this either farther, part of the money they thought they needed to raise was to buy equipment, to actually build buildings and set up the project. So there's some materials that they needed, tractors and the like. Well, people in the community had that stuff. So now they said, hey, well, actually, let's pull the homesteading equipment I have and the building equipment and automated food forestry tools, et cetera. So now they don't need 690 anymore. They actually only need 590, right? Um, so let's keep going. This case, this is stocking the community library. So a lot of us, you know, a lot of families out there have a lot of stuff. Some of that stuff they don't use. That's useful at some times. Um, how cool would it be, you know, 12 families get together for a crowd pooling like this or however many it is, you bring a lot of that stuff that you have and you pool it all together into a material library. 
now you start sharing all of your items that are worth sharing. So that was what you also see here is people are bringing stuff to stock this community library. That's going to give all the sorts of resources and access to things that we need without having to go out there and buy it, right? So we can improve our quality of life by pooling our resources rather than thinking we all need a blender, we can share a blender, things like that. Um, so these are the other forms of capital that are pooled. Um, and the same thing with a, like an electric <coughs> car, for example, is having a community car. If you're all living on one project, it makes sense to reduce your number of cars, especially if a lot of your needs are going to start getting met within that project. You're not going to want to leave that project as much anyway. We see this across the board with projects like this, where people leave less often. So one of the ways that people can pool their resources to come in can be selling their cars and then having that money to then invest into the project. And then people who have you know, a really nice car that's worth having as a community car can then contribute that car as part of their crowd pooling. So you see here, someone putting in a car. All right, and then you can keep going. The next one I wanted to show off was they thought they needed 590, they were still shy, but actually 110 of that was to you know, factor in the costs of paying a builder to show up and do some work and actually building the community center that they were gonna build. Well, one of the people who wanted to join this project happened to be a builder. And they said, actually, I'll show up and I'll put in $110,000 worth of time helping build the community center. So it's like, oh, great. Well, we don't need to raise 590, then we only need to raise 480. And now this particular crowdfunding has just reached a success because they didn't need to raise as much as they thought they needed. They were able to pool the resources from other ways, right? So this is the main concept of a crowd pooling. All right, and then what do we do? Then we issue tokens for everyone. So what we've done is then people were able to show up with different skills, different forms of capital, but everyone equals out at having contributed the same. So someone who was able to come in with $150,000, great. They came with 150, so we give them 150,000 tokens. You know, someone else only had 50,000 they can put in. So they said, well, I'll contribute $100,000 worth of planting out food forests and setting up the gardens, et cetera. So now they're contributing 100,000 over time. So they're also coming in at 150K. So this way, communities that want to have everyone be an equal member, you can set that up from the beginning of the game itself to say, over time, everyone's going to be made equal. Everyone's going to have contributed the same to this project to help it succeed. Um, and then, for example, the person who had the land, they have 300,000 tokens. So now the community is going to set up a buyback plan to buy 150,000 tokens off of them. Or new members coming in might have to buy tokens from them in order to get membership. So this is how people with land that are looking to you know, liquidate some of that land and get you know, financial resources, well, they say, okay, well, we'll contribute land, but I need at least half of it in cash. So how do you do that? You say, okay, well, then new people coming in are going to buy out your tokens, and then that's how you're going to get cash. Um, and that's how this community, this fake community here, said they're set up. Uh, okay, so that's how you actually pull it, but then you're going to, some projects that want to have a micro economy going forward, you can extend this even further. You say, okay, these were the contributions for everyone to be equal and have their $150,000 worth of contributing to start it, but how do we keep meeting our needs going forward? Um, this community was inspired by uh, the research that showed that this community living in the most harshest climates on the planet only needed to work three to five hours a day and all of their needs were met. And they're thinking, well, actually, with improvements in technology and design and how we can meet our needs, we reason that, you know, we only need eight hours a week for people to contribute and we think we can meet all of our needs that way. So this microeconomy was set up with that in mind. They said every member contributes eight hours a week or eight hours worth of capital a week. So in the first instance, this person said, you know what? I don't want to contribute all eight hours because I don't have that. So I'm going to contribute three hours and then I'm going to pay dollars for the other five hours that I didn't work. So anyway, but you can set it up that people are going to contribute a recurring amount of capital with that being how your micro economy is run and all the people's needs are met in your community. Um, so that's the basic idea of, and I can expand on this more in the episodes, but anyway, that's the basic idea of the crowd pooling and setting up your micro economies. Then I get into all the projects again, talk about a region civics year, how we're going through this process, then each year launching new projects. And then, then I talk about the different allies who are showing up here, and then I introduce them all. <laughs> and the main concept of regen civics. 
we kind of came out of seeds with us designing new economic systems. We said, we need to put this into practice. Good, let's launch an incubator, launching on real world projects and building new economies, which is where this all came from. So we have tools to build new economic systems and new financial systems with. We have tools to build new marketplaces and coordinate within our bioregions regions and set up you know, fee-free marketplaces for local food, for housing and all that stuff, right? And these tools exist. Uh, tools for coordinating our organizations, like, you know, with the DAO building tools. So this is where our roles and issuing tokens and setting up those micro economies all function. Uh, open impact. So this is coordinating within your bioregion and within projects across the globe for shared goals towards regeneration. So a lot of our projects could use these to organize the impact that's happening within our projects. So different groups that are working on food or housing and whatever can use this tool set to coordinate their activities. Um, Nestor is also another coordination tool that helps us build out our economies and help map them, see how our economies work, who's fitting in where. So when people show up to the project and they need to have an understanding of where everyone else fits into it, Nestor is that tool that helps show the whole economy, who's holding roles, who's doing what, and give people a good way of orienting into what our new economic systems are. Um, Regen Garden is one of the platforms where we can launch NFTs and different tokens and fundraise for our projects in the Web3 world. Uh, Gitcoin DAO is one of our partnerships for funding. So we can put up proposals. Each one of our projects could put up a proposal each grant round and get funded from a global community to support the work you're doing. Region Civics is going to be doing it directly. And we're talking to Gitcoin about them having one section. Anyway, there's a lot of stuff we're talking with Gitcoin about. We can explain that later. Uh, region Living. So this is an organization that's helping projects actually understand what regeneration is, if this is a new concept to you, and design regenerative systems. So there's a lot that goes into that, and this group has spent decades and decades kind of unpacking those models and how they work, um, and they're helping projects design their regenerative economies. Uh, Universal Land Trust, similar concept, but now with this whole world of DAOs and legal entities and land ownership and all of that, it's immense and confusing, and they've, you know, navigated some of that world and are helping projects navigate it as well. Um, so if you need help with, again, figuring out legal structure and ownership and how you're going to own the land and how to set up a DAO and a do and all of that, um, they're here to help projects there. Uh, DESA, similar stuff with land discovery and acquisition. So projects who are showing up that don't have land yet, you're a team who's motivated, you're like, yep, we want to build a regen economy, but we have no idea about land or where to find it. DESA is here to help, you know, pair you with landowners. Um, and then also help people sell their ownership of one project for another. So they're going to be setting up a marketplace for saying like, hey, I have my NFT for a house ownership in this project, and I want to sell it for ownership of this other house project. Um, <clears throat> you can use their marketplace for doing that. And some other stuff. Permitors for actually having the regen festivals. So when we want to activate one of our projects or we're expanding a project or whatever it is, Permitors can help you actually put on a festival, invite people, coordinate, et cetera. Uh, closer. Closer is here for coordinating our uh, intentional communities, villages, projects, any community of practice and purpose who's coming together and wanting to organize events, value distribution, visits, and membership. They're doing like a proof of exist, um, proof of presence protocol. So if people are on your project within your geographical boundaries, they could be earning tokens. Some people are showing up to your festivals, events, community, whatever it is, they could be earning tokens that can give them rights and governance or perks or whatever. Um, so Closer is a platform for running that. United Planets. So United Planets inviting people into the game. Um, so they're running these leagues all across the globe um, and bringing athletes of systems change together. And then each one of these leagues will also be an organization trying to support the whole renaissance itself, focused on some of the different RDGs. So the regenerative development goals instead of sustainable development goals. Um, so each one of the league is focused on four different one of those goals. So they could be helping projects also address these goals within their you know, bio regions and communities, and maybe even doing some games there with you as well to bring your players on board. Um, more imaginations is this is a huge one because they're at least this is how I understand their concept is that imagination is the thing that's atrophied so far that's been part of the heart of our crisis is people just cannot imagine a more beautiful world. You know, there's a comment that people could you know more easily imagine the world ending than they could the end of capitalism. 
it's like, wow. You know, so they're all about like, how do we actually imagine that more beautiful world? You know, because if we can't see it, we can't build it. So they're all about, you know, bringing back imagination tools and practice and helping people, you know, expend their capacity to imagine and to create together. Um, and then we have the Seeds Commons Studios. I haven't put up a slide about that yet. So I'll explain that later then. Um, <clears throat> and same thing with an incubator. So this just came on board. So it was my announcement a few days ago, just worked with a project here in um, Northeast US and it's gonna be an incubator for projects and for us as well. So for the 13 projects who have completed their season and do a crowdfunding or crowd pooling, and then roles wanna join, then the catalyst team, so it could be a group of like five or seven from that project, can then show up to this incubator in person. Um, so here in the States, and then as however many projects we can get, so maybe all 13 show up and maybe we only have seven. Then as that group, we're gonna walk through this whole process again, refine our economies, refine our roles and our games and get ready for you know, inviting maybe 140 people into our economies or however many we're inviting into our projects, right? So this will be for that small like coordination catalyst team who's launching this project with you to be able to come here and dive deeper and get more you know, training before we move out to our projects. Um, and then that could happen later next year, um, spring or fall, whenever we want to do it. Um, okay, so that's kind of it. And then I talk about a lot of our projects being incubators themselves and then us incubating incubators, you know, so looks a little bit like this because it's worth looking at you know so each one of our projects then become an incubator themselves that are launching seasons so that our projects could keep other projects how to be incubators etc so you can start teaching people how to set up regenerative economies not teaching rather we're learning together um, but you guys get the concept okay um that was a lot it went way longer than <laughs> i thought um so I didn't even get a chance to get into part two, which, you know what, just because we're here and I want to get everyone on the same page, I'm going to brief through this real quick as well. So what did, where did Regen Civics come from? One of the main areas was uh, a few articles that are coming out where there's trillions of dollars that want to move into solving these crises that we're facing, but there's just nowhere to get that money to people on the ground. There's no place to connect, you know, the institutions with huge money to the small permaculture projects that only need 50k. So instead, you know, billions to trillions go into things like carbon capture technology because those projects need billions of dollars. So it's kind of makes sense to them. They have a place to park a billion dollars. You know, our regenerative movement, we don't even have a place to park 100 billion dollars. Like if the world's like, OK, great, we want to put $100 billion towards, you know, centropic agriculture and localizing our food systems, like where do they put that money? It doesn't even exist, right? So part of it was like we want to create that ecosystem where we can put $100 billion and for it to get to, you know, on the ground, practical, the most effective application of regeneration, which is local, decentralized. Um, you guys get it. So that was one of the main areas. So like, cool, what does that ecosystem actually look like? So that's what part two explains is how region civics is actually organized. So let's go through this super quick. We have the, the main core itself, which has some different working groups. We've seen some of these kind of, you know, set up and close and et cetera, but working groups exist within the core contributors. And that's what's happening literally on this call right here is this is one of the, the offerings from the core contributing of region civics to help coordinate the ecosystem, which is what the center circle does. So it helps coordinate all the different projects, coordinate the alliances, coordinate funding. So when money comes in, the core is actually what's directing that funding throughout the ecosystem. And we'll show how that works. So each one of the alliances, they're gonna, the main council in the center that's making all the decision is made up from one or two reps from each one of the alliance organizations. So each one of the organizations that I shared earlier, they're the ones that make up the council itself, right? And then the council is how we decide how we spend money. So let's say we get a billion dollars into Regen Civics, then the council is going to make the budget that says, okay, well, we're going to give 100 million to Alley A and 100 million to Alley B, et cetera. But since the council is made up of representatives from all the alliances, and we're going to have a pretty high threshold for what it means to pass a proposal. We got to get a pretty high consensus rate 
on what we actually need to spend our money on. So this is the main innovation that we're building here within Region Civics is how we um, redirect that billion dollars. And that's a whole other episode. Um, so I'm not even gonna try to touch that. But then our structure also helps us more, make us more resilient and anti-fragile. So if one alley fails, for example, the members of that organization can actually join another alliance, hopefully. And seasonally, like some of our organizations need more people at different seasons. For example, in the region festival ones, the organizations that are focused on like on the ground activations, there's a there's a season where they're most busy and when there's least busy, right? So rather than people having this, you know, very, I want to say not resilient, but almost anxiety producing work environment where they only have temporary work and they don't know what's going to happen next. You can actually bake that into our ecosystem where we know how people flow throughout the seasons. So rather than you know getting hired somewhere and they're firing you when they don't need you anymore, we actually have this concept where you get hired for someone temporarily and then they know where the next organization you're going to go to who's going to offer that work. Um, so one example of this is let's say you help people make videos that showcase what they're really offering. Obviously, you're only making videos that showcase that at the very beginning when they want that video made. Once the video is made, they don't necessarily need to make another one yet, right? But a lot of our alliances and projects need that video made. So we can have one team of people who are making those videos that get to flow through each one of the projects as they need them, right? Um, and of course, you have more projects coming in so that they always have this you know, work that they're getting ways to show up. So anyway, that's just one basic example of that in action. Uh, and then the technology is, you know, what's facilitating that and helping that. So you can see all the different organizations that we're part of, all the tokens that we own from all the different orgs, et cetera. So this is me talking about kind of the summer season, winter season, where some organizations might have more people than others. Um, also, as an ecosystem, I think this would just be awesome. You know, in the summer season, when it's hot, like I would love to be part of those organizations that are on the ground doing the festival work, like being part of festivals, designing them, planting gardens, regenerating the environment, etc. But during the winter months when it's cold, maybe that's when we like go into the organizations that are more on the technology side, like building the tools, like coding out things, you know, designing software, etc. So we can have this kind of flow and balance in our own lives too, as we move from organizations to organizations within the whole ecosystem, right? And this can work from budgeting too. So if the center circle is the one that's distributing out the money, well, they say, well, in a summer season, we need those uh, festival organizations more. So we're gonna give them more money, then more roles flow up there to get the money to doing the festival organizations, right? And then when the summer season's over and we move to winter, the exact opposite happens, right? We send more money to the winter organizations, et cetera. You guys get it. So this is how we start then moving as a whole organism. So each one of our organizations then becomes kind of like an organ within our meta body. So just like after you eat a big meal, you send more resources to your stomach to digest the food. When you're getting to run, you send more resources to your legs, et cetera. We're doing that as a whole ecosystem here. All right, and then a similar concept for the land-based projects. So when projects are part of it, once we actually get going and we launch the do, is one or two reps from each one of the projects are also going to be part of the council during that season. So once we launch Region Civics, and I think this is going to happen actually winter, um, my winter in the Northern Hemisphere, so four more months, um, then each one of the projects that are part of the 13 can then send reps and actually be part of Region Civics forming. And it's a similar concept is then as we get going, we can invest, Region Civics itself can invest directly into projects. So then we can start approaching, once we start having an ecosystem here, we'll start approaching institutions and larger funders and saying, hey, you don't want to invest in systemic change. You're really interested in this, great. We have 40 Alliance organizations and 30 projects on the ground doing regenerative work, et cetera, et cetera. You can fund all of it by investing into the ecosystem. So then that becomes our story of how we're going out with the world. All right. Um, yeah, so you see that. And then we can start creating indexes too from all the different stuff, but that's a whole other topic. And I'll stop there, okay. <laughs> So that's my too long, didn't watch version of what I'm trying to turn into. And you guys kind of saw it. That was my first attempt trying to go over all of it in one go. Um, so sorry if it was a little bit shaky. 
Um, that'll probably turn into 10 episodes that I'll start making over the next few months and getting them out as quickly as I can. But I want now is just some feedback from this, the general flow, does it make sense? Um, any type of responses that you can give from that whole overview, that'd be great because we can keep tweaking it and getting it to you know better meet our needs before I put this out there. Um, so yeah, pausing there, put your hands up if you have anyone. Yeah, Anders. So one of the thank you so much for for all this. It's really exciting to have it as a base to, to work from. Um, I think that one of the things that is really beneficial for all of us is that we have all of us like really to support all of, to support each other through this. And as much as I love the the idea of, of crowd pooling, as much as I love the ideas of all of this stuff. Um, we're all dealing with people, right? And and humans are very unpredictable and people often don't do what it is that they say that is that they're gonna do. And I think that we have all had various levels of human resource issues in what it is that we're trying to do. So I'm curious if we could also like explore some level of collaboration around conflict resolution as, as around, you know, like as we implement these different things, because that's going to create a lot higher level of success for all of us, because people are people. And the issues that I'm having are probably some of the same issues that other people are having that other people will keep having. So somehow, some way, this integration of conflict resolution and, and, and some type of like assurance that these models, that we're supporting each other and moving forward with these models. Um, yeah, I mean, that's fundamentally what I what I see the alliance is itself and how it's going to stick around and keep going is that is the main function of the alliance to help us help each other right. Um, and that's with all I would call them coordination apps is I think one frame we can use or we call them whatever. But yeah, as one community comes up with a conflict resolution protocol or maybe a tokenomic structure. So, for example, you're saying, well, people aren't showing up and doing what they say they do. Well, that's kind of the reason of that green area I showed you where things are accountable. So if you're in your role, well, that role expires in a month or three months or whatever it is. So if someone's not doing what they say they're going to do. You just don't add their role back up. So we have these things in place, like we have technical things up front that help reduce potential conflict, which is also what that green area is. It's kind of like um, filtering membership before they get to that blue area, right? So with that crowd pooling, uh, only the people who come up front get tokens immediately. But if people who are doing a role, they're gonna earn their tokens over the 200 weeks or whatever it takes them to earn all their tokens. And then you as a project could say, well, official membership is only after you've already earned 150,000 tokens. So if you don't ever finish, you know, following through with the agreements that you made, then you never become an official member. And maybe that means you don't actually have a voice or whatever it is like each project can set up their own. So I think there's those technical fixes you have up front and assure everyone's on the same page and you, you know, you're making agreements, you're accountable. But then what I was just expressing is to then get into that blue area where we don't need that type of stuff to keep coordinating. But we absolutely need it up front because that trust doesn't exist and we aren't all on the same page and people don't understand what's going on, which is what this whole thing is about. Um, the other thing that I think is really important is the incubator itself. So having that catalyst team who's going to hold the space for these projects, having us all actually show up in person at one of these projects. So one of the first ones to do this will be here where I'm, I'm moving to at the beginning of next month. Um, so we can do that and actually come together and make sure we're getting coherent, learning from each other's strategies and how to set the container most appropriately so we can avoid a lot of the con, you know, unnecessary conflict. So again, conflict is healthy. It helps us grow and become better. Um, but there's some conflict that's just unnecessary and it's not actually helping us grow because we've already done that growth and we don't need to do it again. You know, so we can avoid a lot of that stuff. Um, by how we set up the structure up front, which is why I've kind of shifted. Like before it was, we were going to kind of rush to a crowd pooling event. But as we started unpacking this, we're like, no, nope, time out, wait. We want to not have so much of this human conflict that we're going to deal with and that could crash our project and have us fail. So why don't we take a lot more time on the front end, designing our economies, getting really considerate about it, how that process works, which is literally what we're doing here with the unpacking of this guide, trying to get cohesion on what that structure looks like. 
Um, so as we start our projects and we move through them, our success rate was hopefully inversed. You know, it would be great if instead of a 90% failure rate, we have a 90% success rate if you actually follow the steps, right? Um, which is what our my intention here is to be, is let's create a process that is, if you follow this process as a community, process being way different than, you know, do X, Y, and Z, or organize a specific way. We say, this is the process to go through to discover how you want to organize as a community. And we need to, as an alliance, uncover what that process really is. Um, so that's a lot and a huge response to your question here. Um, but that's kind of what I'm coming to. <laughs> I know it's huge um, and I know it's a lot to bite off, which is also why I've kind of shifted this to be like, hey, this is kind of a multi-generational journey to, you know, we're fundamentally redesigning civilization for ourselves and for our ancestors, like this is a big deal. Um, we can put a lot more thought and care and consideration into this. Um, yeah, so that's, that's I'm, I'm dancing between that and the drive that, hey, the world's on fire right now, people are demanding this, there's a huge you know, need for it. Um, and yeah, it's time and there's a lot of energy there. So that's the, the tightrope that we're all kind of holding on right now is we need to do this, consider it and slow and meticulous. But also there's a lot of pressure on us to kind of get this thing going. Um, so I don't know the answer to that. And that's my long winded response. So I'll pause there if there's any other any thoughts at all for any. Was that great? Anders, I'd love to hear a reflection on what you got from that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think that um, I think that what I hear from that is that we're gonna do the absolute best that we can and we're gonna utilize all of our input and all the different things that we've all experienced thus far and integrate that knowledge into what it is that we're doing and from there create a system that offers us uh, the ability to keep being flexible and keep integrating what it is that we need to learn as a collective so that we can make the best choices for everybody else in the future. 100%. And why it's so mandatory that all 13 hour projects kind of approach this a little bit different. Um, so that's kind of why I've been really holding the space here saying, no, there is no one right way to do this. There's a thousand right ways, there's a million right ways, right? Because uh, they're all different flavors. So I think that's what's most vital for us as an alliance here is modeling the different types of ways that we're approaching this. So, you know, part of us is to get rid of this idea that there's a right way of making systems change happen. You know, it's gonna look differently. Our way of modeling it is to come up with the templates using one way that's probably gonna be pretty close to what a lot of other people might find their right way uh, and then build pathways for them. So I was also part of the consideration with the 13 projects we picked um, I think some of us was, at least this is how I was approaching it, was having a diversity of projects to be able to showcase. Because then part of our challenge, you know, a few years from now, after we have these templates and we have, you know, here's 112 different regenerative village models. Once we, I think, get to that point, then really the alliance is about learning from ourselves, but then incubating new projects and then putting groups through these templates. And that's when I think things are going to start speeding up where we're, you know, where we're feeling right now that our earth's on fire, we need to build a new world. Like, I think we'll get to that after we have the templates. And then it's really our projects just taking in cohorts of people and helping them, you know, set up their um, projects across the globe, right? Um, and I think we're maybe a few years out from that. Uh, so anyway, that's, that's me also trying to create a timeline for us because I know there's a lot of pressure for us to do that all at once, but I'm saying I think we could spread that out to where right now we're really just focusing on getting our particular, you know, design for a regenerative economy right for our project, learn from each other, and then share it collectively. So I'm building the, you know, the orientation series here, which is the general, this is what's happening, that's going to be immediately followed up, like it's introduced by our introduction videos. So that's how this starts, is we introduce three projects and then we go through this orientation. What's gonna happen after is then they would go and get invited to come and learn about the 13 projects. We haven't created this video yet, but then each project is gonna have like an hour and a half video, probably same length that I shared today, talking about their project, just like I talked about, you know, the general frame, you're gonna talk about very specifically, this is our project. This is how we meet our needs. This is what the needs are. This is what our roles are. This is how we're structured. Like, that process for your project. So that would be the whole flow for people as they'd watch one of the introductions, be like, great, love the concept. Here's the main orientation, I get it. Here's some of the 13 projects. They watch a few, be like, yep, I love this one. 
then there's an application form for them to be like, yep, I get it. I want to fit in. I think I can fill this role. You know, I'll apply to fill that role with the project. And then we get a hold of them and then we give them to you and be like, hey, you know, these 30 people applied for roles in your project. And then you onboard them. And that's kind of the whole flow here, right? Um, I'll stop there. Thoughts, reflections, again, just anything you got for this, get it on in. And it seems like the group's a little bit smaller, so please, people who are watching this recording, um, give me this feedback over the next couple of weeks so I can you know, implement it into the videos. Stephen. Well, Raiki, <clears throat> there's so much to absorb in this overview. It was a really wonderful overview but now I think you need to have sort of a, a, a light version and a detailed version. So if somebody only has time to get the overview, they have an overview they can look at. If they wanna delve deeper, then they can go in the full deck. That's yeah, um, that's what literally this video I think will serve as, is that not medial one. <laughs> and I'm gonna take some other shots at this. Um, so we can start sharing this now. That was my intention was also to share this with projects to kind of get us somewhat on the same page because I know that was missing. Um, and then I'll go through the process of making detailed ones. I clearly, as I demonstrated today, I'm not great at doing the light version. Anytime I try to do a three minute thing, I end up with a three hour thing. So I would love it if someone else is like, hey, I can explain this in three minutes to tell you go at it because I fail every time I try to do that. Um, that's what I tried to do here, and I ended up with you know ten episodes. So like I can't trust me to do that. Well, Lauren, Lauren is very Lauren Archer is very very good at doing the light version. If you want a suggestion, <laughs> I'm not signing up for that right now. That's pretty. <laughs> but maybe we I, can coordinate down the road. <laughs> I even asked Haifa if they could help us with uh, getting the pitch deck for this project here because the Haifa pitch deck is pretty nice. And um, yeah, they said they can help us with finalizing it, but we need to start um, yeah, getting it together. So whoever has some designing skills for a pitch deck, that would be nice. Well, it depends on Reiki, like do we want to pitch this project out into the world or how is our strategy to, to get the crowd? Here's, here's my approach and please people take yeah. different approaches, but so. That's part of self-organization here is we need to be taking different approaches and we probably don't even necessarily need to coordinate all our different approaches. So if someone feels inspired to take a particular approach, just take it um, and then we'll figure out a way to give you some region civics tokens on the back end of that, like or coordinate, it doesn't matter. The point is, is I think we need a lot of approaches. My particular one is making the long version of this. I think people have time if it's presented the right way. People binge watch TV shows all the time and they can spend 10 hours on something. So I don't think anyone's missing time if it's presented the right way. So what I'm going to try to do with this series is present it in such a way that it's fine if it's 10 hours. People are going to watch it. And I also think that's necessary because there's so much that needs to have a like foundation to actually get what's going on here is it's heavy. So like I said, I tried to do like a three minute. What do people really need to know? And I ended up with like 10 episodes of what do you really need to know? Like, it's a lot. So, you know, I, I think that's fine. We just need to create it in such a way that it's beautiful. What I think the next stage of this is to do and planting this idea is to make a proper documentary out of this. So if anyone's inspired to want to do that, I know we had a couple of people offer that, great. And that could also be a, you know, 10 hour long episode series, right? Um, but that's what I'm making. And I'm going to be getting that out over the next two months. Um, I'm going to try to get one out like once a week, carrying each section forward um, with the idea that you watch through that and you're like, yep, I get it. Like there's a renaissance underway. I understand how we can meet all our needs way better and more effectively than we're doing it right now. I understand what's going on with the economy and what different economy systems are, you know, because right now a lot of people are fish in water. Like they see capitalism as just something that's like a natural state of order, like uh, where it's... <laughs> You know, a lot of it looks at like economists as a physical science. It's just, it, it's so far removed from reality that there's a lot of ground we need to cover for folks to like accept that we can create a different story. Um, so that's really kind of what this episode series is about, is just really very practically trying to approach this from first principles. What are our needs? 
How can we go about meeting them? Here's a diversity of ways we can meet our needs differently than we're meeting them now. Here's some projects that are doing that. Here's how we're coordinating to help other projects do that and grow a renaissance of exploring different ways to meet our needs and healing our planet. Like maybe that was the two minute pitch, but anyway, so again, more reflections. I think we're just going back and forth. Felipe, you got your hand up. And if anyone else has anything else, please put your hand up. Yeah, well, actually, well, hi again for some of you. Um, we are going on a similar path here, and we feel at least we want to promote the, the idea that any project or person that wants to join, we should do like a common uh, basket, <laughs> we say in Spanish. <clears throat> Basically, say we, we say, okay, we have five different lands in, dif in different parts of the continent, whatever. Uh, we have some money, we have some skills, we have well, all, all different capitals and we start pitching because many people are coming, not just because they want to invest or they have big capitals, but maybe they want to find a piece of land, <clears throat> especially in Latin America, this happens a lot. And they say, okay, I have, I don't know, 10,000 or 50,000 and probably I don't need all that for what I need. I, in a personal way, but maybe I put that into one of those projects. So we just gather the information of whoever is willing to have like this kind of open share collective funds baskets. And, and yeah, and we've, and of course, this comes with much more <laughs> ideas, but just to put it in a summarized way, that's how I present it. I will present. Yeah, 100%. Um... And for the alliance itself to be that place that can hold all of these different forms of capital that want to come in. So as other people with land are like, yep, this is a better use of our family's farm. Instead of just selling it, this is another way of getting it out. They know where to bring that to and we can start coordinating people. Because the other side of that is there's a lot of individuals who love this concept, but they have no idea how to go about, you know, coordinating with another, you know, 144 other people and starting this and figuring out land and it's just too much. So then as an alliance, that's what we're trying to do is be that, that weaver who's bringing in people who have land, who want to be filling roles, who've got capital, et cetera, and kind of plugging everyone together and helping them meet. So that's fundamentally, I think, what our role is, is weaving all the different forms of capital together into projects. And then those projects are going to follow templates, which are going to be all of the 13 projects you guys have. And then each one of your projects could be an incubator, because this is critical from the human side. Um, and to give more confidence to the landowners and investors and all of that, that one of our projects who have succeeded in creating the template that another project wants to follow actually teaches them how to do it. So, for example, they'd watch it and be like, we love how Finca Sagrada is working with the Kogi and design a new economic model, and we think that's fantastic, and we want that one too. So then Finca Sagrada could have a, an incubation program where people come up, the people who just crowd pooled for their project, and then you're the one that ensure, well, you know, encourages success to really happen. So then the flow looks like after season one are the projects that succeed in a crowd pooling and actually pull all the resources together. Their next step is to then go to one of our projects and go through an incubator process. And I think that incubator process is really where a lot of this magic is gonna happen um, to really, turn the dial towards success. So for example, I think it could be very challenging, this incubator. I don't think it could be designed to make it so everyone gets through necessarily. I think it could be designed that some people might filter out. And I think that would mean that we're succeeding. If everyone gets through, I don't think our filters are strong enough because I just that's just not the percentage of people who are going to be right for projects, right? So you know, the incubator is also part for people to really figure out, is this right for me? You know, am I going to move my family to this project in this location? Like, am I going to be able to show up and meet these agreements? All of these things that could cause a whole lot of interpersonal conflict if they're not addressed, we try to address in this incubator process. Um, this probably requires a whole other episode, and we could talk about it whenever you guys feel most inspired to talk about this. Um, but I think that's really the critical, the other critical innovation that we need to unpack here is what does that, you know, three month or however long it is journey from people being like, yes, we want to be in this, you know, we want to create a project like this. We've agreed to, but we have no idea how to do it. How do they get from that state 
to coming to one of your projects and actually walking away with the tools they need to succeed. And then I think that's what's going to be able to give us a story to go to the large institutions. It's because then we go there and say, look, we have 13 incubators that are incubating projects that are turning the dial on all of the problems that we're having right now. We're localizing food systems, sequestering carbon, building community, you know, building circular regenerative economies, et cetera, et cetera. Like everything we're doing is just all of the tickets on the SDG goals and beyond. So we can say this is how we're doing it and we're incubating it. And we have the capacity then to then accept, you know, large rounds of funding and then bring projects in to incubate and extend. Because then we can grow exponentially, which is exactly what we need to address these, you know, humanities crises. Of course, there's a lot of groups approaching this as well. But I think that's the lens we look at, because then if we have 13 projects that incubate 13 incubators, well, then that gives us 23 or 26 incubators. So you can incubate another 26 projects, 52, 52 incubates, 52, et cetera. And then that's happening every year. You plot that on a curve. It's an exponential growth, right? So I think that's also, and a lot of our projects fit into this, that we are incubator projects for a particular project. And that'd be our first gift that we're bringing. I brought this up a lot, but I think it could be part of like our business models we're bringing together here. Because then part of the crowd pooling, the resources raised, goes back to the projects that are doing the incubating. Of course, you guys are offering a skill and a service, like we need to be compensated for that. So that's how we create a sustainable economy for ourselves as well, is through this education and teaching. All the while, of course, because some people might think, okay, that's unsustainable because we only need to launch incubators for so long. You know, that's true. So the other forms of, you know, stable income for us are our food systems. Every one of the projects here are growing food in some capacity. Regenerative food is going to be in demand for decades and decades to come. And if our nation state is a food exporter and we have all of our need for food met and water met, and we're exporting these things to other nations, that's what's going to provide us, you know, the resilient foundation to survive as a, a new nation, which I'm getting the concept here. And that's kind of what we're building is we're building a different type of networked civilization. And we're thinking in terms then of civilizations and nations do. So what are huge rabbit hole? I'll stop there. Um, I want to put that example uh, more specific to be more precise. Like, for example, I, I feel there are some projects, as you already say, with Anders that are going to move in very different directions, but there are others that might want to move in a common direction. So, for example, uh, projects that are working with, with ancestral wisdom, maybe they are thinking on opening uh, ancestral schools, teaching ancestral wisdom and creating the framework so they unite. And, for example, they make an offer to the public uh, united and not just separate. Or So we create different frameworks that people can Plug in and others would maybe focus on other offering ecotourism or I don't know, or just general permaculture education and, and giving this kind of, of containers could help to move us forward together in, um, in little groups, not necessarily 13. I want to say absolutely, I mean, spot on, Felipe. Yes, 100%. That's the other thing that I think would be incredibly valuable to consider is. What are the roles in each one of these circles? What do those roles look like? And then setting up universities for helping people reskill into these roles. So if you read the book Bullshit Jobs by David Graeber, it's a fantastic book that really helps unpack just how broken capitalism is because of there's so many jobs that are completely useless. And we don't need and they don't improve quality of life or help people's needs get met or any of that. But there are some roles that are, and we need to help people also unpack these things. So, you know, for example, in the food and fertility circle, like you're saying, Felipe, permaculture, you know, centropic agriculture, there's a million different schools on, you know, regenerative agriculture and regenerative food forestry. Like, great. You know, that's, we need universities for that, that are teaching that particular skill. So that roles could be filled in projects with that skill set, right? So that's, you know, part and parcel of the incubator, I think then could have extended, I think it's more than three months, the longer learning journeys for helping understand these roles that fit into each one of these. Um, for example, living water, if we're having people, you know, revitalizing springs, we need a university or at least a learning journey where people come together and learn what it takes to revitalize a spring. Like what plants do you plant? Like how do you clean the water, et cetera. So there's some processes. I mean, they're pretty straightforward and it should only take really like a month, maybe even less to really unpack what's needed. 
Um, but I think that's really valuable because then they go and get that skill. They're like, great, I know how to revitalize and bring back to life springs. I understand that skill. I can go and join other projects with that role set, right? Um, same thing for all of this, trust and comms. Like, how do you run a work decentralized organization, do self-organization and governance, all the stuff that we're doing and communicate that? Like, we need a university for that so people can come and hold that space for projects, et cetera. So I think we're going to unpack. I don't think this is perfect. Like I said, I just kind of threw this particular minimum viable economy together. But what we're going to uncover through this alliance is what are those core circles and what are the fundamental roles that successful projects have? So maybe five years or a decade from now, we're going to come up with a template that's going to be like, yep, we figured out these are like the main circles that successful groups actually had filled. These are the main roles. And then that's what's going to inform what the you know, education of the future really is about. Because then we're teaching people how to fill roles and those things that are really actually helping people meet their needs the most effective way and helping projects succeed. So that's also, I think, you know, if we're playing that, you know, incubator role, Felipe, perfect. Big part of that is having these university and learning journeys available for when people are like, yep, I'm a used car salesman. I really get about that kind of stuff. But, you know, man, I want to join a regenerative economy and I have kind of an interest in food and plants, but I don't know anything. It's like, great, well, show up to this food forestry school. You can join another project as a um, apprentice. So that's a role that could be in your due is you have an apprentice that's, you know, got some certain anyway um and they can go apprentice on a project and learn those skills etc so we need that ramp from people who are like yeah my heart calls to this i love this i have no skills but i'm showing up and i'm passionate if we can build that ramp as well i think that's really powerful um so yeah i mean great great to bring that in all right um we're at an hour and a half i, I went huge here um but i'd still want to hear from more of you because i haven't heard from some of you at all um, so maybe I'm going to call some people out. If, if you're not there, just that's fine. I'll call someone else, but maybe Charlie or Tucker, if either one of you are available, I haven't heard from either of you. That'd be great. Okay, you guys might just be listening and following along. Um, does anyone else have anything they want to bring to this before we close today then? Um, yeah, as always, it's very interesting to, to hear the, the whole picture that, that you have in mind. And um, uh, right now, we're, you know, Finca Sagrada, we're still, um, we'll soon have our uh, LLC or SAS uh, set up. I'm hoping to get that done uh, in September getting that sort of basic um, legal stuff set up. And then Nadim's coming down to help us. Uh, as he said the other day on a phone call, there was, uh, what's the creep, creep in the project. <laughs> um, but well, um, I'm very excited to, to get going so that we're all ready by, uh, Sounds like uh, December is a kind of a, a, a deadline date, and um, we'll. But I think we'll have a lot of basic stuff set up in the next couple of months. So I'm excited about doing that. And in the meantime, each phone call I'm learning more, so that's good. And you know, watching videos and stuff, putting in the background stuff, which I'm happy about. Uh, Walter and Susan, I love you guys. It's so awesome having you two here. The perspectives that you guys are bringing and uh, forcing me also to make this simpler. Just kidding. You guys aren't really the ones doing that. But um, that's it's really something important. Scope creep. I'm re I'm personally not trying to do that. I'm expressing what I think is like a, a multi generational long timeline for us to orient around now because we're building the foundations that are our trajectory of where we're headed. So I want to get kind of alignment to be like, hey, you know, this could, this is unfolding over 10, 15 years until we really see like the output of what we're imagining today, right? So that's also why I'm kind of doing this long tail, uh, you know, trajectory thinking, which might sound really large and intense. And I, that's exactly what it's meant to be um, for us to see, you know, 
what flaws there might be, where we're misaligned, how we can redirect now, what's missing, why aren't we considering all of that, because we can keep reverse engineering it and bringing it back to where we're at today to make sure the next step we, we do take are the right steps, right? Um, at least in my short time on this particular path of trying to figure out systems change, I've found out a lot of the times the journeys I've gone down because it's just been like one step at a time, like you've learned a lot, but you realize you kind of went off in the wrong direction for a bit. Um, and that's what I'm also really trying to avoid with this alliance by making sure a real clear understanding of what it all is and where we're going from the onset um, so that we aren't taking false steps and wasting a lot of time. So again, it might sound like we're wasting time here, and it is if we don't make action, right? Um, so yeah, that's, that's you guys get it. So I won't take any more time explaining that. Thank you, Walter, for bringing that in. That's, um, anyone else have anything else? Or close to that. Anders. Yeah, I just wanted to share that uh, when you do your first take of this thing, I hear your, um, your 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 request for getting some support and shortening things up. So if you want to do your first run through and just create a video, even if it's 30 minutes or 40 minutes long, or even if it ends up being an hour long, uh, just get, get send that over to me, send that over to our group, and so that we can just provide some detailed feedback for you, and then uh, yeah, and then maybe you can do another one. I love that. Yeah. I'll do that. Awesome. Ooh, um, room for one more. If anyone else has anything else to bring in. Awesome. Then I want to say uh, thank you all. I know this was a lot for bearing with. Um, and please consider what was shared today. Give me anything that was missing. If you feel like anything you know, comes up over the next few days and you're like, oh, actually this perspective needs to be taken, please send that to me uh, because then I can incorporate them before I make these first videos. That's all happening now. So I love you all. Enjoy your weeks and I'll see you online. Feel free to Bye -bye. make random noises if you want. Thanks, Aiki. Thank yeah. you. Love y'all. <laughs> Cheers, y'all.